We are back, everybody. Uh, I I want to promise that I was not lying when I said that the Sunday show would continue even in the off season. Weird scheduling. Everybody kind of sad about the season ending, but also just sad that K State wasn't all that fun to watch this season. Uh, so a little bit of a breather for everybody, but spirits are high because these are three guys right here that just enjoy the Kansas City Royals get to two games above 500. Uh, fan was in attendance uh, today on Sunday. So he he got to see MJ Melendez come through for him. And Drew and I were just guys rooting for him on the couch and uh, off to a good start there. But we're here to talk about K-State, more specifically K-State basketball. So welcome into the KSO Sunday show. Mason both Drew Galloway, KSU underscore fan. And we have Jerome Tang to get to as he was heavily rumored for the Arkansas job. Oddly enough, uh, after Chris Beard and Jerome Tang tell you no thanks, Arkansas fans all of a sudden are trying to say that, no, well, Arkansas never actually offered those guys. So, you know, whatever, Arkansas. Uh, and then K-State still has to be active in the transfer portal, and they seem to be in a good position there. So many things to get to with that. We're going to play a fun game at the end and uh, wrap it up on a Sunday and get everybody on with the week. And with everything going on with K-State, I asked Drew this kind of yesterday when – I guess it would have been Friday when we did the show after we got the Tang news. But fan, uh, you were you actually have a real job during the day, <laughs> so a little bit tougher for you probably to follow along with the meltdowns. Where were your emotions at 10 a.m. on Friday versus lunchtime versus three o'clock versus Hey, Tang is coming back. We have that news now. Yeah, it's it's that was a wild day. Um, I was. Our school had an art show. I was setting up for the art show. I was at the art show from five to seven. So I was checking my phone probably more often. You know, we tell our kids in school to stay off their phones. I would have been in detention, I think, by the end of the day if I had been enforcing my own rules. So, uh, but early in the day, you know, I think, you know, everybody kind of thought, well, this is Chris Beard's job to turn down and he's not going to turn it down. And and then Trilly reported that Beard had pretty much been a done deal for the job. And then what, 15, 20 minutes later, recanted on that prediction. And and then things got a little hairy. And then, uh, you know, DY was posting on the board a little bit and I was texting him some. And you get, start to get, well, Coach Tang is going to listen. Coach Tang is going to talk to him. Then I started getting nervous because I thought, well, you know, in the – you, you would check the thread and I would check it 15 minutes later and there would be two more pages of messages. And I was like, man, this is, how do you keep up with this stuff? And then, you know, so late afternoon, early evening, it was, it was looking pretty grim and, you know, I was busy at the time, so I wasn't real on the scene as far as following things. But, you know, during the day I was thinking, you know, Arkansas is already paying, was paying their coach almost a million dollars more. Um, their athletic budget is fifty million dollars more. Um, I can totally understand why Coach Tang would would take this as an opportunity because I, I really believe Coach Tang's ultimate goal is where is the best spot for me to win a national championship. I, I you know you can talk money, you can talk nil, you can talk all those things. I think big time, big picture is where is the best opportunity for him to win a national championship. And I think you know we saw at the end of the day, Gene Taylor come through. Um, give Coach Tang some provisions that he was looking for. Um, I think his staff uh, seemingly wanting to stay in K in Manhattan and be part of K-State for the future probably had a bit of a play as well. So uh, then you're elated. Um, you know, I, I posted a couple of pictures of the bourbons I was drinking that night in <laughs> celebration. Um, and I think there was lots of bourbons being drunk that night in celebration on, on amongst KSO folks. So it was a roller coaster day, but at the end of the day, um, you beat out a, what I'll call a power two program that's in the upper half of their league that has been in the Sweet 16 and Elite Eight three of the last four seasons, Elite Eight two of the last four seasons. Um, you got to feel pretty good about that. And I think the celebration is is warranted for people because that's how significant Jerome Tang and his staff are in this whole thing. Like, I think – at least for me, and I think you guys, and, and certainly some other K State fans out there that I 
I respect the opinion of. I think that they can they can, they know what they're doing and who to trust and how you believe in certain people. And Jerome Tang, there's just something in about him and has always been something about him where like early on in the process, it, you know, we know the the constant jokes, K-State's never won a national title, but you truly believe that and not that it's going to happen, but it can actually be accomplished with him at K-State. And that's not something that you could say for other guys because like Bruce Weber, I I always tell people about, you know, sitting there 2019, that game against Oklahoma when they clinched the Big 12. When Dean Wade dunked on Brady Manick, you know, <laughs> reverse, I sat there and for the first time in my life ever, I told myself, like, this K-State team's going to the Final Four. Like, they were that mm -hmm. good of a team. They had it working in that moment. The irony of it is, is that we didn't know that Dean Wade had yet again just shredded his foot on that play. <laughs> So the best play of the season ultimately <laughs> turns into uh, probably the worst for K-State, and they exit the first round. But even in that process, the the thought was, okay, they'll go to a, they'll go to a Final Four. I didn't think that team could win a national championship. I never once thought Bruce Weber would do that at K-State. I you know I was young, so I, maybe my frank emotions are different than everybody else's. But I never thought Frank was going to do it, and certainly history would suggest that Frank wasn't going to do it. Um, and, and like Frank love him and everything he did for K-State basketball, but like, that's just the case. K-State has the caliber of coach that can get it done right now. And that's significant. And I think what you're talking about fan, I could, I could also see why he would want to go to the Arkansas job. It all makes sense. But at the end of the day, and I think I said this to Drew when we talked Friday morning, when some of the you know rumors got more serious and I basically just said, if you can match certain things that Arkansas has, and they're you know close to even. I don't really understand why you would want to jump ship for Arkansas from K State, given what you have. And what we found out was Jerome Tang stayed. And I think I don't think finances are the biggest driver of this. Maybe NIL finances, but not personal finances for Jerome Tang. And if K State had matched whatever Arkansas was going to pay him, and Jerome Tang didn't feel like he could win a national title at K-State, let alone if you know K-State were to go past what Arkansas was offering. I think that's a guy that still leaves for the Arkansas job because, like you said, he wants to win a national championship. That's what drives him, and I think that's a good thing. It's good to have a coach that that's what genuinely drives you because I think a lot of them are out there to let's just be really good, let's win our league. Jerome Tang no doubt wants to win the Big 12 at K-State. He understands the significance of that, but he understands that there's something a whole lot more important that he has done before as an assistant at Baylor. And he knows that if you can do it at Baylor and, and it was going to take longer time there than it would anywhere else, it can be done at K-State. And he got some of the things that he needed in the process. So we'll go to Drew now on this one. We've had time to kind of let everything settle. Some more of the facts and details come out. What do you think was probably the biggest driving factor in Jerome Tang deciding to stay at K-State over Arkansas, uh, despite Hog fans saying that he was not offered the job? Honestly, the thing that I just keep going back to and what we've heard and what DY has posted is that it just sounds like his family and the staff really wanted to stay in Manhattan, which is a big deal because not only does that mean that Jerome Tang stayed now, but you have to think like you don't have to worry about assistance going anywhere, at least right now, if they really enjoy Manhattan enough to wear they really were a driving force to get Jerome Tang to stay. And I think that that's a big deal because I think that this is a really, really good coaching staff at K-State. And this is kind of like what Mason was talking about. This is the first time that I have felt like that K-State has a coach and a chance to win a national title. And that's not to say that like, I don't feel like that about like football or anything. It's just a lot harder to win in football right now compared to basketball where it's going. So, like, I genuinely feel like if they stay long enough and keep the continuity together, that it it can definitely happen. But it, it's, it was a huge deal for K-State and still is. Like, it, that's why we're still talking about it a few days later is, like, this is a big thing that I can't remember a time where K-State really stiff-armed somebody from poaching mm -hmm. a coach in my lifetime, at least. And it, it was really fun and... Uh, fan brings up that thread and that that thread will just that's like a hall of fame level thread on the board like if you haven't looked at the whole thread yet 
after you watch the video <laughs> and watch, watch, watch all this, like you gotta go read the entire thread. Yeah, I, I can ahead. only I the the only thing that I can remember that was close was the Bob Huggins when Bob Huggins was leaving or in the process of leaving K State. Um, that and I was on uh, I think GoEma at the time. Or, or KSU fans, which became Go Email. Um, and that was very similar, um, except that one didn't turn out for the benefit of K State. But it was, that's the only thing I can remember that was close to this because the end of Snyder was not this level. Like it was bittersweet, but I think most of us were, were wanted that to happen. Then the Bruce was not a, a negative. We wanted that to happen. But Bob Huggins leaving, Frank Martin leaving a little. Similar, but not even quite the same as as Bob Huggins. I would put, you know, Huggins, and then this one, and then Frank as as the message board days where refresh, 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 and hoping for good news, and then it didn't happen. So, yeah, it was it was a wild ride. But um, to move on, I think we'll talk about Gene Taylor. I think Gene Taylor is a pretty big factor in this as well. Well, and maybe maybe I'm wrong here because again, there you know there is a an age differential, and I think I'm of an age now where uh, you know, like I'm I'm 26, so I get that some people would want to be like, oh, you know what, it's just a world we live in. 26 year old guys, hey, they have to do something with their life. Like we're not all going to be plugged in. But from what my thought process and understanding was at the time, like even the Tang situation is different from Frank and Huggins yes. because those in some way started to feel like a foregone conclusion yeah. where Huggins is going back to West Virginia. Like that, that totally makes sense. And I, like, I don't know in what world something could have been done to convince Huggins to yeah. not go back for that job. And then Frank, we obviously know that there was the John Curry dynamic and it ended about as poorly as it could with, you know, Curry just saying, well, actually one of your key guys, he cannot play against number one seed Syracuse in the NCAA tournament. It, it just, you know, whatever. And ultimately like people are going to hate to hear this. I think Frank, I think K State and Frank Martin both won in that situation. Frank got out of a situation he didn't want to be in, and I think if Frank stays much further past that point, I don't think things go as well. And I, I know that we were not on great terms with Bruce Weber, but I don't think things go as well over the next decade if Frank is the head coach versus Bruce. And with Frank, you would have had a lot of emotional ties that would have made it tough for people to want to to let him go. So. I think that's where this is different, where it truly was unknown. And when you hear that Beard is the front runner, you think, why the heck would this guy stay at Ole Miss and coach basketball there over Arkansas? Like, of course he's going to take it. This isn't even going to get to Tang. Like, my threat level there was probably at like 15 to 10%. And then it starts to kind of go up throughout the day. And I, I was I was having lunch on Friday and – and get a tweet about what percentage chance would you put it at that Tank stays versus leaves? And I, I said 60-40 he stays versus he goes. And at the time, that to some people, I know Scott Wildcat thought that was outrageous of me because he said 100% he stays. And then about an hour <laughs> later, I think he came back to apologize to that tweet to, to Greg Hauser and was like, oops. <laughs> uh, because like that's the thing with the coaching search is it could flip on a dime and it did, but K-State ultimately won out and – we know that a lot of that has to do with Gene Taylor and the relationship that he's able to have with his coaches and specifically Jerome Tang. Like, I think there's probably some trauma bonding between those two for what went down in December with the Naquan Tomlin situation. And I, I think it would probably be naive to not assume that that weighed heavily in Jerome Tang being willing to listen to Arkansas but in the end, understand that Jerome Tang loved Kansas State and loved Manhattan enough to look past that and whatever, you know, skirmish went down between his side with athletics versus Richard Linton in the president's office. He said, I can live with that because I love everything else about this situation and I want to be here. But Gene Taylor does, deserves a ton of praise for what he was able to do. And I think people already give it to Gene because they understand how great of an AD he has been at K-State. But – this was just like you, – you, I'm experiencing this right now with a kid. You think, man, I, I don't know how she could get any more perfect. Like I don't know how she could do something like, oh, my goodness, we're so lucky. And then she does it. You know, Now she's added like taking legit naps to her repertoire. 
slept for two hours in the middle of the day. That was really nice. Like Gene Taylor just took a two hour nap on Friday. I'm like, Oh my goodness. Like I already love this guy, but now he's, he's as good as you get. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, like I'm still a little surprised that beard didn't take the job. Like I, I don't really understand what is so much more appealing about Ole Miss than Arkansas. Cause I like Arkansas case state pretty comparable. Like you'd probably lean more towards Arkansas being a better job, but like Ole Miss and Arkansas, like aren't even in the same stratosphere. So that, that surprised me. That's when I started to get to, when I started to get worried, like it, I was like, my threat level is probably even lower than yours, Mason. I think I was at like 5% when we talked uh, Friday morning. I was like, no, oh, that's not getting best beard. Like, it, it, because it was so like, it seems so perfectly mapped out. And I even made the joke of that when Musselman ended up leaving for USC of like, well, it seems like it would be perfect for beard to go to Arkansas, Will Wade to go to Ole Miss, and then boom, the carousel's over. But it never ends up going that way. Because coaching searches can never just be like one perfect thing, unless you're Louisville, because they only offered Pat Kelsey the job. <laughs> yeah, I, point. I, I would agree with you on on that Ole Miss beard situation. You know, Ole Miss is a program that has never made the Elite Eight and has nine total NCAA tournament appearances in their history. So I thought, surely this is a guy that's going to jump. Arkansas has won a national title and been to the Elite Eight twice in the last five years. So. You would think that would be something he would jump at. Now, part of me was like, well, if Beard turned it down, there's got to be something there that could cause Tang to turn it down as well. Um, although early in the day before Beard turned it down, I thought if it gets to Tang, then it's like 90-10, like he's going. I, that was kind of my mindset. I was probably 10-90 if Beard takes – or you know, if Beard was in play, as long as he was in play, it was like 10% chance he's leaving and then once beard was out of play i was like this is probably 90 percent chance he's leaving just because of the resource i just thought he would think i can win a national title here just because they've won a national title in basketball in the last 30 years as it's been a while now but um, they've done it so it, that was interesting you know and, and you know the other thing about gene taylor i think you know he's betting a little bit on jerome tang um, just because you know there's a little bit of pushback from some fans just because um, more than likely Coach Tang got a raise, his staff got a raise, NIL got a raise or promises. But the market value of Jerome Tang changed in the situation. That's what fans have got to realize. It's the market value of Jerome Tang. And it's also the mar market value of K-State basketball. If we still want to be a legitimate player in the game, even if we're not a power two conference school, beating out a power two conference school to keep your coach, even if it doesn't work out in the next five years, still puts K-State basketball at the place we want it to be. And it's not just about Jerome Tang. So, cause so many fans are just making it about Jerome Tang, which is very important. Yeah. And I think he's going to be a great coach, but it's also about the status of K-State basketball, which is Gene Taylor's job is to uphold the status of K-State basketball. And I think he did that as much as betting on Jerome Tang, which I think is a good bet. Um, doing both those at the same time and, and keeping him uh, makes this even better for in my eyes because it, it raises the level of our basketball program, even if Jerome Tang does not work out. I mean, at, at minimum, the NIL resources would have completely tanked after they'd gotten mm -hmm. dramatically improved. The NIL resources yeah. would have gone. All of the progress that they made would have just been gone. Yeah, yeah I, I think, think people, people would have just put it toward football, probably. Yeah. Yeah, yeah or just said, well, you know, there's there's not much point of it now, you know, like because you have to have somebody you believe in to to throw stuff at it and and see how this thing is is going to go because you you know, you're not going to just blindly give it to, you know, some guy that just had two seasons of success in the Missouri Valley. But I think to your point about, hey, this is keeping the status of K-State basketball up here. I think that that also gives you some hope that, hey, if the time ever does come that Jerome Tang leaves for whatever reason, you are in a position where Gene Taylor is not going to settle for, uh, we're just going to have to go out and get, you know, whoever. It's going to be his first big job. Gene Taylor, is, I think, would try to put K-State in a position where he would seriously go out and try and poach from another you know, power four, or power five in basketball, power five school, 
that, hey, this makes sense. Let's try and get him. K-State can be more attractive than where you're currently at, even if you think, hey, I'm in the Big East, I'm in the ACC, whatever it may be. You can go out and make that happen. So I think that's a good thing as well to take into consideration. And, I, you know, at the end of the day, like, Jerome Tang, I think, proved that he, he just wanted to be at K-State. I mean, we saw uh, Jeff Goodman tweeted earlier that he said also, I believe Jerome Tang and his family love it at K-State, and that was a major factor in him staying. I think that I think that's true. I think that really did play a, a large part in this, and you, you, that's something to be considered. And, I mean, the Snyder thing, it, it's, it's a cliche at this point, and everybody, I think, kind of tongue-in-cheek says it, but it's good to know that, what, we're getting close to – 40 years after the fact of when he showed up on campus that that still holds true. That should make K-State people proud and and have, you know, new, reinvigorated love for their school and, and where they come from. So that's significant. And now everybody can move on and focus on a true offseason where Jerome Tang is at K-State. Nothing else that's crazy is going to happen. And you can work on improving the roster, which – as we have seen, is going to be something that needs to be done. Cam Carter, gone. Dorian Finister, gone. Jarrell Colbert, gone. Doug McDaniel, in. And then there are you know, just a couple of the portal targets on the screen right there. There are others out there that they're in contact with, but those are probably uh, four of the more significant ones right now. And certainly Michael Brown-Jones at the top there is one that K-State wants badly. So do a lot of other schools. But he announced Friday morning, which the craziest time for somebody to do this, because two of the three schools he listed, their coaches were the top two targets at Arkansas. But his final three consists of K-State, Ole Miss, and Pitt. And if you want to believe some of the things that have gone down with the Jerome Tang situation, it would appear that K-State, who already had a lot larger pool of NIL to work with this offseason, we've already seen that with Doug McDaniel. I think it's gotten better since Friday afternoon. And that certainly helps when you go from landing a guy like Doug McDaniel that was 16 points a game, 37% from the three-point line. And now you're looking around and you're trying to say, okay, who else is out there? Who else do we want to get? Well, then you bring Michael Brown Jones in the fold, and he's a guy that was a high-point scorer. He is going to add really, I mean, some serious versatility for K-State. He's 6'8". He can shoot it well. Like, He's efficient, you know, everything that you want in a guy. Uh, this would be significant for K-State to add a player like this. And it seems like they're in really good spots for some of these guys. And now, like Terrace Reed, we talked about earlier this week, K-State can kind of pick and choose, it seems, right now. They don't have to just be, we got to get this done quickly with everybody. We got to take who we can get. Just you know, can't let this go any further. So I'll start with Fan on this one because we can start with Doug McDaniel. Where do you see his impact being, and how much better is K-State already with McDaniel on the roster versus knowing who the best one or two players on K-State's team last year were? Yeah, the, the thing you like about him is he is a distributor that can score. I think you know he's got both those skill sets. Looking at his film, he's, he's able to score uh, some, some runners and some things like that that we haven't seen for a while, even even Marquise Noel wasn't a great at shooting runners and being efficient off of those. So I like that. He, you know, he wasn't super efficient, um, but part of that was he he shot a lot of two point jump shots. Um, he was pretty decent at them. Like he made them at a mid forty percent clip, which is pretty good. Uh, but you know, this past year he was a really good three point shooter, almost thirty seven percent. But also almost five assists a game and a, a two, two to one assist to turnover ratio. So you you combine all those things, I think you you get a good player. You know, I think his two points shot selection will change a little bit. Um, K State system seems to promote finishing better at the rim, even for small guys, because even Tyler Perry had a pretty good field goal percentage at the rim. Um, the last two years, McDaniel's has only been thirty five and forty three percent at the rim. I think we'll see that in, improve just by being part of our system at K-State. The other thing I'd like to see him is, is he's not real adept at getting the free throw line, uh, which was one of Tyler Perry's strengths, actually, um, for a small guy is, is getting the free throw line. So, um, But you like that he's more of a creator. He's more the creator of Marquise Noel than Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry was a two-guard uh, and a, a mid-major two-guard trying to play a point guard at the Power 5 level. 
Doug McDaniel's a power five point guard moving to another power five school to play point guard. So that's what I like about him. He's, he's small, you know, you get, hopefully you get another sizable uh, perimeter piece to, to help out with the depth part, but he's legit. I think he can be a all conference type uh, guard in the big 12. Um, and I think he's a very key piece moving forward just because of, of the dimensions he adds uh, to this the next year's team. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big Doug McDaniel fan. I knew, I actually knew a little bit before he entered the portal uh, from some of my friends that are pretty plugged in in the DMV area that he was somebody that was going to transfer. And like right away, it was like Georgetown, Maryland, like he's probably going home. And then like the recruitment goes on a little bit later and it's like, oh, no, K State TCU. And then for K State to really shove it to TCU and Mason's mm-hmm. boy, Jamie Dixon, <laughs> I, but that feels pretty sweet. <laughs> so uh, what, what I like about him is uh, the quickness is really good. Mm-hmm. He can really shoot it. Somebody compared him to Tyrese Maxey on the board. And like, I, I really like that comparison. He has a little bit of Marquise Noel in him. I, I can already see the deep threes coming where we're all like, oh God. And then it goes in. So uh, I, I really like it. In case they needed a creator at guard. I mean, it, it, it was well documented throughout the entire season that they just didn't have anybody that could create. And, and I'm really intrigued by him and Day-Day Ames on the offensive end at mm-hmm. playing and how they can feed off of each other because I think that they can work really, really, really well together. Look, I want to defend myself on Jamie Dixon real quick. <laughs> Outside of the Big 12, I will talk Jamie Dixon up to uh, people. But inside the Big 12, I will just kind of say, eh, you know, he's pretty meh, whatever, uh, as we've seen by the fact that TCU still yet to finish a season above 500 in league play. So uh, I'm a big Doug McDaniel fan as well. I think he just brings some dynamic play that K-State just didn't have last year with the players they had. I, Tyler Perry just – he undersized. We've seen it work from Marquise Noel. We know that Doug McDaniel isn't necessarily the biggest of guards either, but Doug McDaniel, and I'm not saying this like a, a one-to-one comparison, but in terms of kind of explosiveness and, you know, kind of dynamic play, Doug McDaniel is a lot more like Marquise Noel than mm. he is Tyler Perry because he can actually go out and I think make something happen for you. And I just don't think K-State had that this past year. And that's a really big problem because the guy that was probably best at it was Arthur Kaluma. And we know that the shot takes a while to get there. Doesn't want to use his left hand. There are a lot of flaws with that. Cam Carter probably profiled as the guy that needed to be like that, but he couldn't hang on to the basketball. So a lot of flaws with K-State's team this past year. Now it seems like things are, are in a better spot. Uh, in terms of Cam Carter leaving, I know it's kind of old news, but I haven't gotten your guys' thoughts on it. Uh, are you, and the other guys that we already know are in the portal. Are any any bummers there, or is it just best for everybody that those guys are moving on? Happy for Cam Carter, and hope he does well outside of one game. Yeah, I, I think for whatever reason, I think Cam Carter moving on became the best option for both parties. Um, and I don't know, you know, I don't know exactly what happened there, because um, this was a guy that was all about Coach Tang halfway through the season in interviews, and then um, maybe he still was at the end, but there was an, a fit problem, and you know, we talked constantly this year about the turnover problem and the inefficiency problem with Cam um, as a high usage player. So I, I think, in at the end of the day, um, it became the best for both parties for him to move on. And I think he found a good spot. You know, he's going to be an SEC player, so good for him. And he's home and good for him for, for doing that. I hope he does well. I agree with Drew all but that game where he gets to return to the Octagon of Doom for one last time. Yeah, I, I look, I think it's probably best for everybody. He gets to go home. He's probably going to make good NIL money down there. But K-State just wasn't going to be able to be what they needed to be and what fans wanted if Cam Carter was on this team this coming season because he would have wanted to have been in the same role, and that's just not possible for where K-State needed to go. Like He's he's probably a better version of the Ish Masood situation from last year where you know Ish wanted to play more. I get it. He's played college basketball a long time. Like You, you want to go out in a good way. 
K-State wasn't going to be the spot for him in terms of more playing time, even though I think they both could have used each other this past year. Cam, same type of deal. You don't want to slide back from being one of the go-to options to, hey, you're kind of going to go back to what we had you in the year we went to the Elite Eight because you're just not good enough to be one of those top-end guys. So I think that's good. In terms of the other guys, I mean, Dorian Finister, I'm, I'm not the Dorian Finister fan that uh, some people really seem to be at different points uh, this year. He, he was fine for what they needed him at different points, but that's just not a Power 5 basketball player. We've known that now for a while. Uh, and then Jarrell Colbert, I think in, in a role it makes sense, but K-State obviously is flirting with some bigs in the portal, and they're, they're looking for some upgrades there. And that's fair because Jarrell Colbert, he's not going to ever, I think, develop into a spot where he's, you know, a true starting big. He started games for K-State this year, but he was not going to be impactful for you ever uh, enough to where it warranted, you know, not trying to get guys over him and diminish his minutes. So uh, I'm not beat up about anybody else for K-State. And really, I think K-State's been blessed both on the football and basketball side to not have too many guys that have entered the portal that you go, dang, really would have liked to have kept that guy. like. Kobe Savage is probably mm -hmm. the the most mm -hmm. painful loss they've ever experienced in the portal. And I think even given how that kind of played out, and if people know the details there, you probably got to the point where you're like, you know what, K-State's going to be fine, especially now that we hear Joe Klanderman just talking up the safeties like that might be the best unit on the defense this year. So we'll talk football another time. In terms of what K-State is looking for in the portal, Michael Brown-Jones towards the top, some of those other big names, NIL going to play a role. Uh, what does K-State need in your guys' eyes, and how do those guys kind of fit the bill? Yeah, given the, the, given the current roster, I you know, I think more post-depth because uh, we really only have three guys uh, there and only one has played much. But um, I think if, if Michael Brown-Jones would be a, a huge get just because he's a guy that has a – a high, a high, a broad skill set. I'll just say it that way. Um, granted, his numbers are inflated because he's a SoCon player, but he was a first team SoCon player. He was a guy that is a basketball in the SoCon. <laughs> he, he has improved a ton over his career because his first two years at VCU he didn't do a whole lot. Even his first year at uh, UNC Greensboro wasn't great, but last year he was one of the best players in the league. And a very efficient player as well. That's what you like to see. Very good at getting to the rim, very good at getting to the foul line, very good at rebounding, could shoot the three a little bit. Um, so it, it can add a big piece to this roster. Um, I still think K-State then needs to find a five and more another wing, um, hopefully, um, and or more perimeter depth of some sort. And then, you know, some of this hinges on whatever Arthur Kaluma try, decides to do as well down the road because I think he's – a piece you would take back if he wants to be back. and uh, But you can probably go find a piece, slightly different wing type, um, but that can replace him. But, uh, you know, if they if they can get uh, Brown Jones after the, the dead period ends here in four or five days, that would be a pretty good guy to get in on campus and see what happens. Yeah, uh, Fan kind of took uh, the positions that – I was going to talk about. So we'll, we'll slide into like more of like, uh, Mike, Michael Brown Jones. Uh, so he doesn't have a lot of, uh, power six competition, uh, games, but he had, I believe it was 24 against Vanderbilt and had, I think it was like 18 or 17 against Arkansas. Uh, both games were this year and he was really efficient from the floor in both games. He can do a lot. I kind of called him like the rich man's David Gasson, where he can he can do a lot of what Dave does, but was a little bit more efficient at it uh, this year at UNC Greensboro. Uh, Bart Torvik actually had Brown Jones as the number one player in the SoCon mm -hmm. this year. So it would be a big get. I think he's ranked like n number 13, 14 in the on three transfer portal rankings. But you get him, you get... Doug McDaniel already in the fold. You probably still need a big uh, Clifford Omori. Omori. 
uh, would be a massive addition too. I'm, because... I'm glad you tackled. Try to tackle that first. Oh, uh, there's no, there's no <laughs> shot of me tackling there. Hey, if there is a guy, if but, Kaluma uh... comes back, you're gonna have the PBS kids after school yeah. hour with Clifford <laughs> and Arthur together. That yes. would be that'd be really nice to just and Doug those and Doug yeah, and Clifford, Doug. Yeah. And Doug. I mean, come on, but it, it, those would be huge additions. And I mean, I already said. Uh, Friday night that I think that K-State's going to end up signing one of the best transfer classes on paper in the country. And hopefully that translates to the court. My, my, my old school Brown Jones comp was Jeremiah Massey that can shoot it. I like that. I, I remember Jeremiah Massey vaguely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. I Look, I, I think with the setup they have, and obviously they're, I think they're in a really good spot for Brown Jones, given what we kind of know NIL wise and how it seems to be that things are going. That should give you a lot of excitement because that already is a really good class with those two mm -hmm. guys. And Drew, you were talking about where Brown Jones ranks. Uh, K State bump already for Doug McDaniel. He was 21st in the on three portal rankings, he is now up to 14th. Uh, so, you know, that the K State bump is real, people. It exists now <laughs> with Jerome Tang. And uh, I'm sure that once Brown Jones commits, he'll probably be like number five or something, jump from where he's at at 19th right now because he was 15th. So we'll just see how that kind of plays out for him. But K-State could – I mean, this this is shaping up to be – you go Elite Eight, you dip down pretty hard more than you would want, but they're going to be putting themselves right back in the thick of things. Now, with how K-State is tr having to do this, and I think it's going to take a while until you can develop that high school recruiting depth – that Jerome Tang experienced at Baylor where they were successful in the transfer game before the portal was even real, but they paired it with the fact that they were just so good at bringing freshmen in and developing them. And I think that's what Jerome Tang would like to do at K-State. I think he understands that. I don't think he wants to have to add three or four big pieces every off season, but that's where they're at right now. Is there any concern that even with all the talent they bring in that this kind of, backfires or doesn't gel in the right way to be a team that should probably be top third of the big 12 next year. If they get the talent we're thinking of and be a team that's trying to get to the second weekend of the NCAA tournament. And maybe th those are lofty goals coming off of what they did last year. But I think pairing Tang with that kind of talent, that's what you expect. Uh, I don't have any concern because the one really, really talented team, we saw what they did in year one. So I, th I think if the talent level's there, I don't have any worry about them meshing. I mean, they this team uh, this year was not very talented, and they still almost found a way to get in the NCAA tournament. So I, I don't really have any worries about that. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think I think the biggest factor, and who knows, you know, until there's any restrictions on portal NIL situations, um, I don't know that the old way of development and continuity is going to be the way for very many teams anymore. I just, it's just going to be who can land the best free agents and then who can gel them the best. My, my biggest concern is that they avoid what they did last year and, and going into August, you're two guys short on your roster. Um, my, my key is get your key pieces signed by May or June so that you can get them all on campus and you can do the type of team building in chemistry you need going into the, the fall and, and going into your, your fall practices. And that's really where they lost out last year is bringing in Glover in August and bringing in McNair in September um, and, and really wasting a trip um, to UAE and Israel where you're trying to build your team and you hope that's your catalyst for the season. But the team they had there is not the team they had in October even. So, um, and, that, and it wasn't the same offensive scheme. No. They really did kind of waste the trip. Yeah, it was really a it. huge waste, and and it's unfortunate, but it's just the way things happen. And so that's my biggest thing is get your key guys signed. And I would rather be, you know, even Kaluma didn't sign until June, right, last year? It was, mm -hmm. was you yeah, know, I, I would hope that we can get those guys. You know, I, I, it's that balance of – you know, you don't want to just rush and sign guys. I think, Mason, you're right. And just you you want to be able to have options. I think our NIL being better will help us in that regard. Yeah. 
but hopefully we can get those guys signed. And then, you know, I looked at what was the biggest piece of the Sweet 16 experience or continuity. And experience was by far, I think 15 of the top six of the 16 teams in the Sweet 16 had an experience ranking in the top 130 in Ken Palm. And 15, 14 or 13 had a ranking in the top 100. A lot of those teams did not have continuity rankings in the top 200 because they were they weren't continuous rosters, um, but they were experienced rosters because they brought in experienced players and then they gelled them together. And I think that's going to be the key moving forward in the portal here until it has any restrictions: is that can you get experienced guys? Can you be old in March and then get those guys playing together and believing in each other? And I think Tang is good at that. I think he maybe wasn't as good at that this year. But I think there were some circumstances that made it more difficult than he wanted it to be. I also think that bringing back all three freshmen from yeah. this year to next year isn't an insignificant thing. Like they're at least trying to build that continuity more and develop the younger guys. Well, and I, I think the, the NIL thing is so big, and I'm glad you brought it up again, fan, because that that is one of the number one things that can help you be a little bit more picky about mm -hmm. what you're going to do in the portal. But it also goes back to what you said earlier about Gene Taylor upholding the status of K-State basketball that – like K-State basketball I think was already in a really good spot, and I think some K-State fans would even underestimate where it was in people's minds. But Jerome Tang no doubt elevated it. Like, again, I'm not trying to be corny because that's what you know Tang said day <laughs> one. But it is the truth. And so I think with the NIL – resources that k-state appears to have right now and then the status that you have you can be a little bit more picky because guys in the portal will wait on you possibly and you can come in at any moment and be a legitimate threat to get some of these guys and i, I think that's a big deal uh with the way that the transfer portal works out so we'll see how it uh kind of works out and rolls from there but any other uh words on the portal that you guys want to throw out before we move on to our final thing uh, the portal keeps just getting bigger. So yeah, that's true. Yeah. There, there'll be new names alongside these four, I'm sure. And that's even if K-State does well and gets like two of them, like we're still going to have a lot more yeah. names to talk about. Yeah. Cause I mean, what K-State they, right now they still have three open spots to work with if I'm not wrong. Uh, so you have that, and then if Kaluma decides not to come back, you'd have another, and then you, you know it's still not oh, close to guys, so more guys can enter, and we'll see how it ends up working out. But all right, let's move on. Final thing we're going to do, new thing, we're going to call it the starting five. We're going to do this each week uh, in the off season, where it's going to be a random topic. Sometimes it'll be about basketball, sometimes it'll be about football. We're going to go through and we are going to draft uh, essentially a team, a roster. Uh, they don't have to match in certain criteria, and this is one of them where the guys do not have to match each other. They, You don't have to be – because we're going to do basketball team today. You don't need like three guards and two forwards or whatever. It can be whatever because we are going to do the starting five of random K-State basketball players, and it can be any name that you think of. You can pick that guy. We have no criteria on this, just they have to have been at K-State. They don't even have to have played in the game because I'm sure there are some guys out there that – you might think I want to put on this list that you never saw in an actual game. That is fine. The only thing is we're going to put it up to a vote. So if you're watching and, for example, I don't know, Drew thinks that he's getting real cheery and he wants to be a pain in my ass, he says Javon Thomas, and you're like, Javon Thomas is not some random guy. He might be one of the shittiest basketball players K-State's had in the, in the lifetime of the program. That's not a random guy then you don't vote for Drew. You say, okay, he doesn't have the strength of a roster there. So <laughs> it's up to you. In your head, whatever you think is random, you get to choose it. My apologies to Javon Thomas. He <laughs> might be a nice guy. You were friends with better players on the team. I just – you are, are probably the face of bad Bruce Weber basketball. So uh, my apologies. I don't disrespect you, the person, because I know nothing about it. I do disrespect you, the football player. Maybe you shouldn't have been in that position. Joe Hubner, I apologize to you as well because you were undoubtedly going to be thrown under the bus. You too in that boat. So, without further ado, we are going to do this. Uh, this we, is 
This is oh, your baby. This is your baby. You can be the 101. No, I don't want to be. I'm I'm going to leave it up to you guys. <laughs> so I'm just gonna make that known. Uh there, there it is on the screen right there, so everybody can follow along. Uh, we'll see if I did. Yeah, there we go. There, that's gonna work. I got the the names and everything ready to rock. Uh, uh Drew, you get to go first. Fan will go second. I'll go third. So then I'll get the back to back because we'll just snake this sucker. Right so uh it. Drew, lead it off. Oh god, the 101 in our first ever uh draft here. I'll go Javal Miles. That's a great pick. That was one that was that was in my head. That was, so, the, that was the first name that came to my mind when you brought this up before. I I love I love Javal Miles. Not again the player, just the <laughs> fact that that was the first spot you went. So uh, I I give you credit for that, and uh, I'll go make sure that I spell his name correctly because I'm sure we will undoubtedly have disparaging <laughs> comments about these guys. So at the very least, I do not want to spell uh, any names wrong here. So. Uh, I'll I'll work on getting that up there, and uh, I'll keep it in the back of my head that you did go with the great Javal Miles. Fan, you can uh, you can go now. I'm going back to one of the best Bramlage dunks, Kenyatta Dix. Kenyatta Dix, you, you I, probably will not remember that one. Boy, I genuinely didn't know that that was a person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh I'm not entirely sure that that's appropriate. Uh, it's D I X D I X by the way. Okay, probably very appropriate for this list though. So I uh, okay, you're gonna have to spell it for me. I might just put dicks. That <laughs> might... dicks. I'll get you the spelling. Okay, I can find it. I think people, if people are from that era, they will probably undoubtedly. Uh, <laughs> know who that is then because man they that will is remember quite the, the dunk they will remember the dunk okay all right Rem they all right we have a a promise that they will remember the dunk okay uh well my first pick this is a guy that i love with all of my heart and i have fond memories of him as a i guess i would have been nine years old serge Afelli has to lead Ooh, off my list here nice. i mean i'm a i'm a serge Afelli guy i have to give him the the love and respect he deserves so Serge Feli is number one for me. Um, number two, though, I, I was trying to, throughout this entire process, try and think of where, like, I would want to go next. Um, this one, I, this is one where people might try and contend and come up in their head why this guy is or isn't random. But I think this has to be one that I say. Uh, I'm going to go with Brandon Bolden. Uh, you know, Because I think that's one, yeah. too, where – Depending on where you kind of were in life, you might have tried to trick yourself into saying that, hey, you know, Brandon Bolden could be something, you know. So maybe, Brandon maybe Bolden one of the best block shots. One yeah. of the best block. It still like randomly shows up on Twitter once in a while. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's like, you know, that's why I think people might push back on it. But he did it against Southern Utah, and I can't name another <laughs> single thing he did at K State. So Brandon broke, Bolden broke is hand. number two. Yeah, he he did. at least twice. <laughs> yes. Okay. There you uh, go. He did break his hand. I see. I'm getting both of my 101s. I thought. I thought that Mason, you were going to go this route because this was the second name that I thought of was a uh, Bucci Awaji. Oh Ooh. shoot! Yes, yes, yes. Definitely on my list. I am a Bucci guy. Uh, also, though, it's fans pick uh, in the snake draft. So you are uh, you're you're early here. I was going to give it to he you. Can but have, you're early. He can have Bucci. He can have Bucci. <laughs> okay, I'll give it to him. If we, the because way I, that it looks on the screen. Okay, well, don't pay attention to the screen. I'm just going in order of where the names are for everybody. <laughs> I am going with Pero Vasiljevic, one oh of the God. best Australian <laughs> players ever at K-State. This this is also, random players, not just hard to spell names. <laughs> just go Pero, P-E-R-O. <laughs> I mean, he I was. you're either going to win or also, lose this because we can't spell the names. He was also part of the Manny Dyes wanting to fight Todd Stewart, the Collegian beat writer for K State, there was he wrote an article about oh. Manny Dyes being the worst Division One basketball player in the history of college basketball, and Manny Dyes and his sidekick Perel Vesiljevic <laughs> formed okay. into his apartment to beat him up. I've heard that story. I didn't realize that Pero was involved in that. Pero was part of it. Yes, Tom okay. Asbury recruit. Yeah. All right. Well, Drew, since you did go out of order, this is technically your pick. We owe it to you. <laughs> Uh, 
I'm not going to make you forfeit it like the, the NFL would. So who is your your pick on what technically should be the back to back? And uh, share any memories of Bucci Waji you have. I just I just remember him like in my childhood hearing that name, and I was like, that is not a real name. Like there is no way that that's a basketball that's a sick player. name. Uh, but I'm gonna stick with kind of the the Serge Feli uh, era and go Jermaine Maybank. You son of a gun! Murder, murder! I hate you. I hate you hard right now. That I was, I I was we grew up in the same era. What we grew up in the same era, so that makes I, it hard for us. Well, I know, but I was like, I was thinking, I was okay. Here's the deal. I just assumed that maybe that would be one that somebody would go, ah, I have a lot of love there too. Like it, how random is that? So I was going to try and sneak it in at the end Ooh, to try no. and, you know, get people off their, their the game and the scent there. So I'm, I'm, I already love your roster. I love what <laughs> you've done here. Uh, and this, this is, is you, shouldn't, you shouldn't have given me the one-on-one. Yeah. I'm, I'm not happy about it. Uh, I should have just stuck to my guns and taken the heat in the game that I created. Uh, fan, you, you, it's now your pick, your third pick. So well, have you, it. Here. And again, you can just use the one, his first name oh, on God. this one. And, and it's not, it's not hard. This one is not a hard name, but it's close to my heart because this was a Junction City grad, Dax Jones. Dax Jones <laughs> All was right. a center from Cloud County via Junction City High School. Well, Mitch Fortner would be proud. Cloud County, stand up. Okay. Well, now, I mean, hang on. I got to gonna scratch some off of my list here. So I got Mason in shambles. <laughs> I mean, that I, I was trying to get him at four just because I, again, did not want people to. Um, all right. I have two guys lined up, though, that are Bruce era from bad teams that I really like. Uh, and I don't know if it was, you know, dumb sophomore in high school, Mason, trying to believe that. Uh, they were good. I'm going to go Jeremy Jones. Uh, ooh, ooh. This For a stretch in my youth, Jeremy Jones was the lock screen on my iPod. Uh, <laughs> taking, a, taking a three at Oklahoma in a game that I'm sure K-State lost. But Jeremy Jones is my pick. And then in turn, let me turn around, and there have in the last – 15 years been two guys with this name to play at K-State. I'm taking the older one, the one that I also wanted to talk up. It, fan, any guesses on where I'm going here? Uh, I know the, the double name has me thinking. I'll know, I'll know it when you say it. I'm going Trey Harris. Okay, Ooh. there you go. The uh, good Trey Harris. The ranked yes. Trey Harris. <laughs> yes, so uh, Trey Harris is there on the list. So now we go back to – uh, I guess uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, we, we would be fan now. I'm, I'm yes. all I'm, sorts I'm gonna of give confused. you. I, I want to give you another great name that is hard to spell. Okay, Mar Marcela de Barosa from Brazil. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna go M D B O M A M A R C E L O. Okay, there you go. Just Marcelo. Marcelo? Yes. Okay. He was, right. he was like from some ranking. He was like somehow top 101 ranking. Played like a year and a half and got homesick and went back to Brazil. Another another big time woolly recruit that didn't pan out. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, so we've got we've got that figured out. We've got that down. So Drew, uh, you now have back to back picks to finish this out, and uh, we'll we'll go on from here. I mean, this is like the OG like first like true transfer that I can remember K State getting and like the Bruce era. And he was so freaking bad. Oh, I, I think I might know where you're going with this. You want to take a guess? You can take a guess. Adrian Diaz? Ooh, no, but I thought about Good him. Okay. Not on Good my list, though. But we're going with uh, Maldo Sala. Oh, Maldo <laughs> Sala. That seems mean to Maldo. I don't remember him playing a game. Oh, no, he played. Uh, I'm trying to think of what game, but he played. Um. He played in some of those. Mount St. Mary's guy. Yes. 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 The Mount. I, so, I, re yes. I remember when played he played in the NCAA tournament. I, yeah. I, I remember when he committed. Big 12 I, champion. I was like, why? Like, why <laughs> Why did you think that he could do anything? His career stats are terrible at Mount St. Mary's. I mean, that staff, all, like, 
It's just where, you know, guys get just stray shots from me, but <laughs> this is the staff that thought Casey Eziegu was like the next Hakeem Olajuwon or something. They, <laughs> they talked him up. I mean, I, I knew a guy that was a manager on the team at the time. Then we heard the staff talk about a bunch and it was like, Oh man, Casey is just shredding these guys in practice that the year that he had a red shirt. And then you start to think like, Oh, now I see why this team sucked so bad. The last three years of Bruce's career is because the guy that could, you know, barely move, it was just shredding guys. And all he could do was dunk for the first 15 minutes of the game was electric against Wichita state though. in uh, intra. So I'll give him that uh, pick number five for you. I love my roster. Uh, my my last one is another Bruce guy. Bruce has kind of taken a lot of shots from from me in this in this little game here. Uh, we're gonna go. Uh, I how I used to call him uh, Jack Crap. Oh, <laughs> my, another one on my list. One. That is a good one from California. Yes, I. That's another one where I don't remember him really playing. I don't think I don't think he ever played in a game. I yeah, and I don't know. He may have redshirted a year. I think he and was then, like left in the middle of a yeah. season. Something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I remember. I just remember that the players called him Jackpot, and <laughs> and uh, when you know the K State social team was in their infancy on YouTube, they had like a video where uh, Wyatt had to sit down and talk to him, and and you know it's in house production, so they were trying to make you think that Jackpot is going to be a player. Uh, Jack I don't think, crap. Don't think it ended up working out for him or K State there. So all I right. Hope, I hope that he's listening to this. That's the one I'm, I hope is listening. I'm gonna yeah. doubt he is. I just don't think that he spent enough time here for that to resonate with him. But you know, we'll see. Maybe, maybe it works out. Okay. Uh I will I will let Fan give his final pick and then uh he can give us some insight on whatever this, random foreign this, player he's gonna pick. You 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 this one is going to be maybe my best pick because I, you they just had to sign with K-State, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. they just, yeah. They this had to be person, loosely affiliated. This person signed with K-State. I don't think they ever even made it to the States. Sadiki <laughs> Sadibi, the French volleyball player. It was so going to be a future NBA player. All right. Well, you're just cat. getting a French volleyball guy. French volleyball Sadibi. guy. Wow. Everybody, everybody was excited when we signed Sadiki Sadibi. What this era was this? Was, this was this was Jim Woolridge again. Wool, Wooly's also taken a lot of shots. Hey, you know, and that's a guy that he's he's really nice and still like really like committed and everything to like he he would come on the game sometimes. Yeah, and low key, the odds of good. him listening to the show are probably better than everybody else on this yes. list. I, I would agree with that. Right. Yeah, maybe maybe Serge Felly. Maybe Serge <laughs> Felly still. I think he's a doctor now. I think I read that story like eight years ago or something. So yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, I'm. I you know the more I think about it, the more I'm okay with my list. As much as I love the two guys in the middle that Drew took, uh, how I'm trying to think how I want to finish this thing off though. There are a lot of ways that I could go and a lot of names that I could pick because I have them bouncing around. Do I want to take like a walk on? Do I want to take somebody with some shock factor? I thought that this was a guy that maybe drew would take, man, do I don't know that I want to do that. I think I want to, I think I'm going to go a different route and then we can have some honorable mentions on here. I'm going to take Ron Freeman. I think somebody yeah. has to take Ron Freeman and I remember Ron Freeman. The I'll Cali be the guy shooter. to do it. The Cali. Three point shooter that couldn't yeah. shoot Freeman. Well, it's tough to shoot when you're just <laughs> randomly thrown out there late in the game. Come on, dude. So yeah, Ron Freeman. That is uh that is my pick there, and uh, I'm I'm sticking to that one. Although I did think that at one point Drew was maybe going to uh, take Good News Capagel. Ooh, I, I did think about that for a while. Yeah. Um, that's a good one. That's a good one. But that's that's also one that, like, I think it's such a, like, out there name, and he never actually did anything. And, like, he, he didn't even – he came, like, mid-season, right? And then was, like, on the team yes. for, like, yeah. two yeah. semesters, but it was, like, spring and then fall. Uh, so I didn't know how random that one would work he out. He was the rare different. basketball early enrollee and then never did anything. Yeah. So that – there's the list there. Uh, it's a good list. Yeah, I mean, fan I mean, really does have random guys, but <laughs> he might get hurt because 
Half of those, I don't know that we're even going to be able to confirm that they, they're real people <laughs> or were affiliated with K-State at one point. Uh, any any honorable mentions out there outside of Good News Capagel, who deserves a shout out? And I, 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 you know, I hate to just keep throwing guys under the bus randomly, and I'm not trying to do this. Uh, Dave Lewis, great PA guy at K-State back in the day, was really good to me, gave me my job at K-Man. Uh, but at one point on – on the air, he pronounced Good News Capagel's name, Good News k Ghoul. <laughs> probably would have been more badass and given Good News a better chance of actually getting on the floor if his last name was pronounced k Ghoul. But that should be evidence right there that he never played in the game because Dave was the PA guy and he never had to learn how to say that last name. He had only had to read it. So that probably supports the, the case for a random guy. Uh, but I'll defer to you guys on honorable mentions that might be out there. Uh, I, one of my honorable mentions that I thought of, but I didn't think that he was random enough, uh, was Montavious Murphy. Mm. Yeah, probably not random enough. Now, it also it hurts because he probably would have been random enough on like almost every basketball team at K-State in the last 40 years, except for the ones he was on with Bruce because they were so bad, so he was like forced to play. And – you know, there was some promise there, I think, before he got hurt. And then after he got hurt and was out for it, just kind of fell apart there. So, uh, I, Montavious Murphy, I'm not going to totally poo poo. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go with uh, a player that played on the only K State NCAA tournament team in my college era. And that was the team was led by Elliot Hatcher and Tyrone Davis, but not one of those guys. It was Anton Hubert who was a JUCO transfer, I believe, from McPherson College, maybe. And he hit a game-winning three to beat the Bradley Braves in in Bramley's Coliseum. But then I think he left at semester and never played again and didn't get to play in the NCAA Dang. tournament. But Anton Hubert. Well, that's – Pretty big that might make that's I mean that's a good one just from the fact that you hit a game winning shot and then you, you don't even play the rest of the season. You <laughs> he, leave. Hit a, he hit a game winning shot against the Bradley Braves. Yes. Probably helped the resume enough, you know, avoided a, a Q4 <laughs> loss. So <laughs> that's a big shout out to him. Uh yeah, I'm trying to think of any others that uh I mean I already mentioned Adrian Diaz. I did think about putting him on here. I think at one point, uh didn't his brother – I think his brother was playing for North Florida and came and they played in Bramlage against each yeah. other. Yeah. Um, yes. That seemed – I think I think big guys tend to lend themselves more to the random game because, you know, Zach Eady is the king of this conversation right now, but, like, are they good or are they just tall? If you're just tall, you get a lot of second – a lot of second chances to be a real basketball player. And uh, I think we, we've seen that with some of the names on this list. And other guys – I mean, I got a team – at the, my last three picks, if they had just been given the chance by Bruce to, you know, actually play real minutes and and get into the flow of a game early, they might be the top three point shooters in K State history. We just won't ever know because Bruce devalued scoring the basketball and playing his best players. Um, I had a very emotional meltdown when I found out that Bruce wasn't going to play all those guys. At, I think it was Texas Tech. Uh, the year that everything fell apart, Foster's sophomore year, I was like, this guy's an idiot. What is he doing? <laughs> and then that was also paired with the fact that I had been to the Georgia and Texas Southern games and consecutive uh, outings uh, that season, and I had a lot of nasty Bruce tweets that would have just – I mean, they probably would have gotten me canceled uh, today if I had put him out there. So uh, uh, any any other thoughts on this list? And I guess we'll ask – who each person would vote for. You can't vote for yourself. So really that just basically leaves it to you. You can only pick one of the two other guys. Uh, but I want fans opinion of our list. And then Drew and I can pick uh, either mine or his or, or fans. I, I really like Jermaine Baybank and I really like Brandon Bolden. Those, those are two great picks for this list. I, those are excellent choices for random K-State basketball players. I, I the I, problem is I love Jermaine Maybank so much that <laughs> like he's not random in my head. And so then I think, well, do like all the other K-State fans think of him like I do? You know, is he as random in their minds? So because because there there will be a contingent of fans who, like, didn't he score 20 against KU? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did. 
What? How did that happen? <laughs> See, I, I like fans list because it's like I've never even like heard of these guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I thought fan might bust out some dudes that like. Yeah, I was not alive when they played, but. I've probably heard of their name in passing at least once or like gone through a media guide. And then he's like, well, you know, 60% of these guys never actually made it to campus. And, uh, and you know, they were fan fiction. They were, they were random guys that, uh, that Tom Asbury just mentioned to get the monkey off of his back and the angry mobs. So, uh, yeah. And the fans going to have to explain to people who the French volleyball guy is. I know that's for sure. So people will, if people were around in the wool area, they will know. They will know. Okay. People were around. Uh, I, I mean, I, I got to love Drew's list because, I mean, four of those dudes were names that I considered. Um, I mean, two See, of them man, are personal I'll, I'll, favorites of mine, like all-time guys, Bucci Iwaji and Jermaine Maybank. So I'll only add like the French volleyball, Siddiqui Sidibi. There was another guy in that class <laughs> named Marcella de Barossa, who was from Angola, who was you supposed to him. be. You picked him. He's no, on that, your was, list. I, that was a different Marcelo. That oh was Marcelo. There was a de- another Marcelo uh, that was from Angola, not de Barossa. Um, I, I got his name wrong, but there was oh, another no. Marcelo so, from Angola okay. that was coming with the French volleyball guy that was going to revive K State basketball. Wow. <laughs> I mean, this, that's what a, what a, what a turn of events to find out there are two Marcellos in the fold for K State. I'm, I'm floored, but all right. Well, there's the, there's the list there. Uh, Everybody will get the chance to vote on it. We'll have the results next week. We will, uh, we'll keep track of the standings throughout the uh, off season because we'll do this all the way through August. So anytime we do a Sunday show, we'll come up with something. And if anybody has an idea for something like this, it can be serious. It can be as not serious as this list was. Uh, You can leave it in either the thread that this will be posted in, or you can also go ahead and uh, comment it on the the YouTube as well. So we have options there for people. You can also tweet at us. Yes, tweet at us. Uh, Everybody knows fans handle at this point because it's it's there constantly. (laughs) You can find Drew and I if you want to. Uh, if you're looking for mine, just go ahead, ask an angry Nebraska fan, and they'll uh, they'll be all over it for you. So, <laughs> hey, shout out to Tom and Aga. He won the uh, college three point contest. So another reason that he is my guy. And I was not making fun of him for crying. I was making fun of Nebraska. He was just sadly the vehicle for me to make fun of that sad and sorry ass program. So, <laughs> all right. Oh, it's a fun fact about sorry ass Nebraska teams. Uh, my, my dad and brother and Ari- they went to Arizona early in December. They played golf with Richie incognito. Oh, wow. And, uh, my dad said that like, they were, you know, like whole 13 or something. And he just says, okay, I, 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 I finally have to ask you. And my dad was like, I know that he was just thinking that I was going to bring up the dolphins bullying thing. <laughs> and like, he probably gets that a lot. And my dad just goes, so I went to K-State. We're big K-State fans. Like, I was at that 03 game in Lincoln. Like, what was that like? He was oh, asking about right. K-State shredding them up there. So I just wanted to throw that out there to twist the Nebraska knife a little bit more for people. But, all right, pretty successful I, show, I think. I, and, I had uh, to look up the name. The name was Carlos Morex. He okay. was the Angolan player. And then there was another gay, guy named Usmane Cisse, who was at the same oh. – there was a like this. Usman's a great first. It was a it was a basketball factory Christian school in Atlanta that these kids were playing at that Woolridge found somehow. Well, Cisse, I don't know which one, but it was the, a different Cisse. The yeah. FIFA players out there, yeah. they will know that yeah. there was a guy named Cisse in like 08, 09. He was fantastic in that game. Uh, that has nothing to do with the basketball Cisse that fans bring it up. You also said the name Marisa. I thought. You know, Isaiah Maurice was a name that could have been tossed mm. out there, uh, who actually yeah, went on to one. play real minutes and be decent at Memphis. Uh, and then Dante Williams was also a big in, during that, that was, time. Yes. That I thought about I. It feels like when K-State has bigs, they kind of come like one, two, and they're never any good. But you're going to remember those guys 20 years down the road. And like, oh, you know, they had, a, they had a moment. Isaiah Maurice played well in that must-win game in Kansas yeah. City against Baylor in 2017. Yeah. So. Props to him for that. And, hey, some of these random guys, I don't have bad things to say. Just if you were a bad basketball player, I'm going to say it. Uh, as Eminem once said, if I'm going to say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. So 
that's there you go. There you have it. Great way to end the show. Some people are like, this guy is an idiot. Uh, Drew and Fan really showcased their stuff in this one, though. So that's the reason to come back next Sunday and also to be right back here on and whenever you're watching this because D.Y. and I and Drew will have plenty of content throughout the week regarding probably more Tang stuff that comes out, transfer portal and basketball, and loads of football stuff as spring ball rolls on. And we'll also have a, a weekly recruiting update with Drew that I promise we will not sandwich right after we just talk about the world melting down and Jerome Tang leaving for Arkansas, which he ended up not doing. So that will do it for us. We are out of here. Thanks for watching the KSO Sunday show.